Hello and welcome to my channel, my name is Leo. The last watch video I published was a Waltham size 16 and I decided that I needed something different. So what I have here today is a tiny ladies fob watch. This watch was made by Lindex and it is a Swiss watch. The age of the watch is unknown but the movement inside suggests that this watch was made any time from 1966 to 1980. The diameter of the watch is 23 millimeters. The movement inside is FHF 69-21ST and the dimensions of the movement are 15.3 by 17.8 mm and the thickness is 3.6 mm. Yes, it's tiny. I don't know what the 69 stands for but the 21 stands for 21,600 beats per hour and the ST stands for standard. It's working but it has not been serviced for decades. When I put it on the time grapher it's gaining a couple of minutes a day despite demagnetizing it and the amplitude is low, around 190 degrees, so it would certainly benefit from a service. I'll start with removing the case back so I can remove the crown and stem. I'll loosen the setting lever screw. The crown and stem can be removed now. And I'll secure the setting lever screw for now. I'll put the case back back on, not to cause any damage while removing the hands. Now I can remove the front bezel so I can get to the hands. Note that I positioned the hour and minute hand prior to removing the crown and stem in a way so I can easily remove the hands. I really like this Bergen dialer protector. They call them universal protectors. I found them much nicer than plastic bags and the traditional protectors you slide under the hands, I'm not keen on them, they're just too thick. I wouldn't normally shake the hands off, I would turn it upside down and pick them from the protector but you wouldn't get to see it. There's a lot of stuff I do I wouldn't normally do but when you work for the camera so you can see everything, you don't have much choice and you have to do stuff you wouldn't normally do. Just like now, I'd use a case cushion normally but if I used it now we'd be out of focus. I'll loosen the dial screw so I can remove the dial. I wish I could see the screw slot, for me it's hiding behind the dial. Here we go, we're out of focus now. I'll remove the dial washer and the hour wheel so they don't fall off when I turn it over to remove the balance. I forgot to record putting the stem back in. It's got to be in to remove the power from the mainspring. It's quite fiddly with the small size of the movement. I have to be very careful not to break the stem. Now let me remove the balance, I always feel better when the balance is out of the way. Now the pallet cock and the pallet fork and once they are removed I can get on with the rest of the movement. Now I can turn my attention to the dial side and disassemble the keyless and motion work. The setting lever first, this one is secured with two screws and note that before I remove the screws I release the tension from the spring by disengaging the spring from the setting lever stud. Now 
the minute wheel. The intermediate wheel. There you go in. It's tiny. Note one side is beveled. It needs to be facing down when assembled. Now the yoke. I don't know why I use the screwdriver. I have plenty of tools here that would be more suitable for this job. I'm ashamed of myself. Don't do that, guys. Now the yoke spring. Why on earth did Bergen stop making the cannon pinion remover that removes cannon pinions that are less than 1mm in diameter? It's beyond me. Now I can fully unscrew the setting lever screw, remove the stem and let the sliding clutch, winding pinion and the setting lever drop on the mat. As with most movements, the crown wheel screw is reverse threaded. The crown wheel. And the crown wheel washer. The ratchet wheel screw. The ratchet wheel. The click screw. The click. And the click spring. Now I can remove the barrel and train bridge screws. I'll gently lift the barrel and train bridge until I get a decent gap there to lift it with my brass tweezers. Now the train is exposed, I can remove the train wheels. The center wheel. The third wheel. The fourth wheel. I have to lift and slide the escape wheel out of the main plate. The setting lever screw. And finally the barrel. The barrel is on a staking block. I'll grip it with my tweezers and cover it with a plastic bag so nothing comes flying out. Now I can remove the barrel arbor. I'll hold the spring in place with my tweezers and use another pair to remove the arbor. The barrel is so small that I cannot use both thumbs to get the main spring out of the barrel. I'm going to hold the barrel with one hand, keeping my nail on the main spring and rotate the barrel with my other hand, slowly releasing the main spring out. All parts have been cleaned, but I'm going to clean the capsule for the escape wheel in Horosolve, followed by a rinse in IPA before I oil the jewel. You sometimes forget how small the movement is when you zoomed in. So here we go, this is the part I'm going to remove. That's a ruler at the bottom of your screen. As you can see, a lot of the time you'll be looking at 7mm across your screen. I'm only showing you the final rinse in IPA. 
the movement was quite clean to start with, so I'm not going to peg out the jewel holes, but I'll use my brush and give it an extra cleaning IPA. The cap can go back now. That's my automatic oiler with Mobius 9010. Here are the parts needed to assemble the going barrel. Again, first step I'll use Horosolve, second step I'll use IPA, but I'll only show you the first step. Depending on how dirty the mainspring is, I sometimes repeat the first step until it's clean. That definitely needs doing again. That's Mobius 8200. I'll run it all along the mainspring to lubricate it. I'll clean the mainspring binder with a piece of Rodico to make sure there is no dust. I have the arbor hook aligned with the hole in the mainspring. I didn't want this to happen, I wanted to push the end in, but it's not a problem. The drum is slightly smaller than the barrel and I'll be able to insert it in the barrel regardless. Here we go. Let me insert it in the barrel. There we go. As you can see, the end sits in the barrel perfectly. Here's our barrel arbor. You can see the hook here. I'm using a cushion with a soft center so I can push the barrel arbor down. As I'm pushing down, we're going out of focus. That's the problem with macro. It's in now. You can see the hook in the hole. I'll put some HP 1300 here before I put the lid on. I'll use the barrel closing tool to close the lid. This barrel is so small that I couldn't hear the click or feel it being closed, but it's closed just fine. I'll put some HP 1300 here to lubricate it. I'll test the side shake and end shake, and you should be able to see the oil there. Here are the parts to assemble the train and barrel bridge. Except the setting lever screw, which I'm going to lubricate with HP 1300 and insert it in the main plate. I'll also put a small amount of the HP 1300 on the top section of the setting lever screw. The escape wheel first. I don't normally push wheels into the pivot holes, but I don't have many options here with this design. Fourth wheel. Third wheel. Before I put the barrel in its place, I'll put HP 1300 here. Now the barrel can go in its place. Before I put the center wheel in, I'll lubricate it with HP 500 here.
Now I can insert the center wheel in its place. Before I put the bridge on, I'll put HP 1300 on the arbor here. Now I can put the barrel and train bridge in its place. It's just the escape wheel that needs some help to get the pivot in the hole. It's quite tricky with a small movement, I can't see it very well. Let me have a look at it from a different angle. I still can't see much. Ok, I had to do it off the camera. To see it well, I needed to tilt the movement and you wouldn't see a thing. But everything is in its place now and I can secure the bridge with the three screws. Let me test it before I tighten it. It's looking good, I can tighten the screws fully now. One more test. And everything looks fine. I'll test the side and end shakes. The center wheel is fine. The third wheel is fine. The escape wheel is fine. And the fourth wheel is also fine. I'll give the train one more test and we'll have a close look. I'll start oiling with the SK pivot. This is Mobius 9010. The fourth and third wheel, Mobius 9020. Note the sinks are not quite half full as they should be. I'm finding oiling on the camera quite difficult, so I'll finish it off the camera and you will see the final footage with the correct amount towards the very end of the video. The center wheel, HP 500. The oil sinks for the third and fourth wheel on the motion side are hiding behind the escape wheel. I'll be using my dust blower to move the escape wheel. It stops in different positions and gives me access to the oil sinks. I had to do this off the camera, but you should be able to see the oil in the sinks here. Let me zoom on it a little. Yes, the oil is visible in the sinks. Mobius 9501 on the center wheel pivot for the Canon Pinion. Let me turn it 180 degrees so you can see the grease and I'll put a touch of the 9501 on the opposite side too. If your screen is large enough you should see the HP 500 here. Now I can put the Canon pinion on. This is the crown wheel washer. I'll put a little bit of HP 1300 here and also here where I cannot see. 
Now the crown wheel can go in its place. This can now be secured with its screw and it's reverse threaded. I'll test the operation. It's rotating nicely. I can tighten it now and I should have remembered that it's reverse threaded. Final test. And it's looking good. Now the click spring needs to go in its place as it is positioned under the crown wheel. I'm going to put a little bit of HP 1300 on the post here for the click. Now I can secure the click with its screw. The ratchet wheel can go in its place now. I'll secure the ratchet wheel with its screw. I'll hold the ratchet wheel in its place with my brass tweezers so I can tighten it. That's it. Let me give it a test. And it's all working fine. I'll put the setting lever in place and screw it down off the camera. I'll put a little bit of Mobius 9501 on the winding pinion teeth. And a little bit of the 9501 on the sliding clutch here. I'll put the Mobius 9501 on all the friction places on the stem. I was trying to turn it round to lubricate the other three sides, but I'll have to do it off the camera. Now the winding pinion can go in its place. And the sliding clutch. Now I can insert the stem. Some 9501 here, and I always ensure that there is some on the sides too, as the yoke is also pressing on the sides when the clutch is being moved from one position to another. A little bit of HP 1300 on the post for the yoke. Now I can put the yoke in its place. I'll put some 9501 grease on the friction points where the yoke spring is going to go. I'll turn it round in a moment so you can see where the grease is. You can see the grease and I'll put the spring in its place. I'll hold the spring down with my probe. The screwdriver that was near my hand was not ideal. Let me use my tweezers instead. Here we go. Little bit of HP 1300 on the minute wheel post and also on the post for the intermediate wheel. The intermediate wheel with the beveled edge facing down. Now the minute wheel. Little bit of 9501 understood on the setting lever. Now the setting lever can go in its place. The setting lever is secured with two screws. I'm not tightening them fully at this stage. I'll push this section in its place now.
and now I can tighten the screws fully. Let me test the operation. Winding position is fine. And the setting position is also fine. The balance complete and the pallet fork went through the cleaning process, but I will also dip them in the version B dip. I keep this bottle in the fridge to minimize evaporation. That's watchmaker's tissue paper on top of kitchen paper. Let me dip the balance in. Once more for a good measure. It evaporates very quickly, but I'm going to very gently blow some air on it. I'll also dip the pallet fork in. This pallet fork is very, very small. That's the exit pallet stone and I'm using Mobius 941. I'll put the pallet fork in its place. I can't see the pivot hole very well. I positioned it so you can see it, so you have to bear with me. There we go. Let me put the pallet cock in. I'll give it a few turns and test the pallet fork. Screw it down. Test it again. And I'll tighten it now. Final test. And it's looking good. Now I can insert the balance. I have to be very careful here because the balance spring is positioned under the center wheel and with the size of this movement I don't have much space here to maneuver it. It's turning very nicely. The amplitude looks good. I'll secure it with its screw. I'm going to clean the jewelers now. To release the spring, I push each prong towards the other, one at a time. I'll lift the end stone and the shaton with a piece of rodico. I do a two-stage process. Firstly, I clean the jewels in Horosolve and then I'll clean them in IPA. I'll show you only one step to keep this video reasonable length. The 
This is Mobius 9010. I can now place it back and secure the jewel with the shock spring. Same on the motion side, I push the prongs towards each other to release the spring. Lift it with a piece of Rodico and do the same two stage cleaning process as with the other jewel. Mobius 9010. Now I can put it back and secure it with the shock spring. Now let's have a look at the escapement in action. I regulated it and it's been running for a few minutes. As you'd expect the timing and amplitude is better in dial down and dial up positions than when the movement is on its side but it's not running too badly for a standard unadjusted movement. I sped up the footage so you can see it in several positions. Now I'll finish the motion side and I'll put the hour wheel and the hour wheel washer in its place. The dial is looking good but it could do with a light clean. I'll use a new clean piece of Rodico. Now I can put the dial back on. There are two dial screws to secure the dial in place. This movement holder is designed for hand fitting. As you press down on the hand, the plate lowers and the stud supports the center wheel pivot. It eliminates the possibility of damaging the jewel when the pivot shoulder is pressing on the jewel during hand installation. I'm using the circles to guide me to the center. I'll put the hour hand on first. It's quite a tough one to put on. I have a hand fitting press here on my bench and why I didn't use it, I really don't know. I'll rotate the hand 360 degrees and check how level the hand is. I'm happy with that so I'll install the minute hand now. I'll give it only a gentle push for now, I still want to be able to position the hand. Now let me move the hand into its position. I'm happy with that, so I'll push the hand down fully now.
I'll check the clearance and also the level of the hand. It's looking good. To be able to put the movement in the case, I'll need to remove the stem. I'll loosen the setting lever screw slightly. No, it's not going, so I'll need to turn the screw a little bit more. That's it. I'll put the movement ring in the case. Let me align the cathode in the movement ring with the hole in the case. Now I can put the movement in. That's in now, so I can insert the stem back in. Now I can put the bezel with the crystal back on. That snapped in place and I'll turn it over so I can tighten the setting lever screw. There we go, I can put the case back on now. And there we have it. Let me set the time to the show off 10 past 10 time. And there you go, the watch is finished. I could have replaced the crystal, but I know for a fact that it's not going to be used and it's going to go back in the drawer, so I'll leave it as it is. It's been an easy one to service, but challenging due to its size. If you want to support the channel you can buy me a coffee, link is in the description and if you're interested in what gear I use to create these videos there are links in the description. Now I'll let you to enjoy the final macro footage and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now!